Welcome back from that short break. You're still watching New Vision TV News. My name is Lynn Komjisha. And now for news in business. In business tonight, OTT has been the most evaded tax at a rate of 80% in the projected revenue with a shortfall of 234 billion shillings. URA targeted to collect 284 billion shillings, but 49.5 billion shillings was collected at the end of the financial year 2018-2019. Tonight, we ask Paul Busharizi, our business analyst, how URA got this wrong and is OTT a failed tax? I think uh, the principle of the tax that uh, the way I understood it when they introduced it was that, listen, there's a lot of economic activity going online yes. and we, we are having difficulties finding, getting that revenue to tax. Mm -hmm. So why don't we uh, then tax uh, the means to the revenue, which, is, which would be data and access to uh, over the top telecommunication yes. services or something like that. So. Mm -hmm your social media. So that was the principle, that there's economic activity going and economic activity should be taxed. Yes. So this is how we're going to go after it. They obviously did not anticipate the resistance to the tax. 80%. Clearly. Either they didn't anticipate the resistance to the tax or they overestimated actually how much uh, data is being used, which seems a bit uh, unlikely, mm -hmm. seeing it would get the data from the telecom companies. So, well... You know, they, they, just has, they just have to reassess their projections for the next year, clearly. But, Paul, 80% yeah. is huge. I think one of the principles of a tax is that it should be enforceable. It's no point mm -hmm. setting a tax mm -hmm. and then you can't collect. So, you know, by that measure, this tax is probably uh, doesn't, uh, is useless. Doesn't so make I mean, if, you, if you're so off by 80%, that's really amazing. You know, it's, it's crazy. But maybe it's just a function of it's a new tax and people, these other avenues are, are convenient for now. Maybe people will just come around and say, why not just pay the tax? Are there other new taxes that have been like this? That have been so dramatically, mm -hmm. can you call it, that have failed so <laughs> dramatically in the first year? I can't actually think of any. In 97, 96, 97, I think they introduced VAT. Mm -hmm. There's some resistance, but uh, a lot of the VAT passes through a lot of the uh, the collectors of VAT were also manufacturers. Those were easy to, mm. so it didn't fail. Like this is this is I think this is unprecedented. Is it, yes, yes. Mm. So what are they going to do? What what now? Well, they they'll just keep on collecting the OTT. We, I, I think, think they'll so. one year is not enough to determine a trend. If we see next year we. Uh, let's say we budget for f <laughs> now we say we be a bit more realistic and budget for about a hundred B and we mm -hmm. still get you know, 30B, then you have to really, really yeah, think absolutely. The, the tax, yeah. But I'm sure most of us are excited that it failed for one reason. Mm -hmm. uh, you people were warning, uh, m there, were, there were demonstrations over this tax. And so I'm sure some people are very excited that uh, somehow it didn't work. <laughs> However, it's for your own good. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. That was news in business. And now for a part of Africa series today, we look at monkeys in Uganda. Uganda is blessed with a big number of monkeys found in most green covers across the country. Today, we look at the many species found at Ankara Foundation in Mokono District. At Besania Hill, Mukono District in the central region of Uganda is where you find Ankara Foundation, a home to so many monkeys in Uganda. The monkeys here find shelter in the evergreen vegetation. In this area, they jump from tree to tree to interact with themselves and also the visitors in the area. They vary in colors. You can see black and then brown, and some have both colors. Their major food is bananas and even leaves. Some hunt for the fruits that grow on most trees to change in diet.
Mokono District is blessed with so many monkeys as some can be found in other areas such as River Sezibwa. A group of monkeys may be commonly referred to as a tribe or a troop. The many species of monkeys have varied relationships with humans. Some are kept as pets, others used as model organisms in laboratories or even in space missions. Monkeys can be a delicacy. Their brains are eaten as a delicacy in some parts of South Asia, Africa, and China. In some parts of Africa, they are sold as bushmeat. Uganda is blessed with a big number of monkeys. These can be found in all the green cover across the country. I am Rethina Seja. We meet tomorrow for another Palo of Africa adventure. For more Palo of Africa stories, visit our website www.newvision.co.ug forward slash Palo of Africa. You can also grab yourself a copy of the Sunday Vision that carries more of these adventure stories. Now for a special report, we look at Pablo's wide smile that is hidden in deep pain. He makes fun of everything in life, but when it comes to HIV, popular comedian Pablo, real name Kenneth Chimley drops the jokes. The pandemic claimed his parents' lives and four of his siblings. In a very personal interview, Pablo tells us how HIV AIDS changed his life and his worldview. <music> And bright colors, fancy clothes, larger than life. Yeah, for men. You cannot mention Uganda's top comedians and miss listing Pablo among the top three. And on his jokes, we have laughed and loved him. However, behind the brain that makes us wash away our pain, stress, and even troubles is a heart that hides the pain of lost both parents and siblings to HIV AIDS. He was only 10 when his father died of AIDS-related sicknesses, followed by his mother. And five years later, four of his nine siblings followed still from the same illness. At Tangaza Arts in Makere, Chikumi Chikumi, Pablo has opened a center to train young people, including those living with HIV, in different skills. On a mildly sunny Monday afternoon, the popular comedian gave us a sneak peek into his dramatic life. I was born in Imbala Hospital at the time. My mother was the district commissioner and uh, spent there just like a year or two. Then we came back to Kololo, and that is, was on Awampeo Avenue. Where we stayed, my mother was uh, working with the, the, the judiciary at the time. And then in 1988, when bad luck chose, my dad closed chapter in 1988. And uh, that's when I started my transition from urban to rural. I tell you, rural urban is okay, but urban rural is crazy because there's a lot of cultural shock that you get to experience along the way. And, uh, but for me, I, I was lucky that I was meant, I was taken up when my father died in 1988. We had been pampered, you know, we had been pampered. They used to drive us to school. We were from an affluent can home and uh, everything was at our, at our, our bake and call. We had a silver spoon in the mouth and when he, my father died in 1988, it started our transition from grace to grass. Even though he did not live with them for long, Chumli talks about his parents with special fondness. My father would tell you three stories in one. It's up to you to decide which one to follow. You know, that kind of thing. And I think I pick it from him. And I think he would, think far, he would speak faster than he would think, you know. And, and then he, oh, he had a passion for, for, for rally cars. He was very... Was, they call them, I think, pace setters. The guys who drive before the rally cars. That was him. He, he used to do it for the late Jim Dean and Frank Nekusa. He used to do it for Sam Sally and Eddie Crane's Kayua. So he was always there. I remember he had a Datsun. It was UWZ902. 
and he was always there. He loved football. He was a KCC fan. He had these caps written on Kasasiro style. Every time there was a match at Nachivubo, KCC is playing. I used to tag along, and, and that was my, that's how I got to meet the guys like uh, Higeni, the late Higeni, Philip Omondi. And, and on the other side, my mom was, was laid back. She was an academician. She was very passionate about books. But she loved laughing. She loved laughing extremely. Her, her laughter was so loud. So she was so blessed she couldn't contain it. In the days when his father succumbed to HIV, the disease was shrouded in mystery. It took him a while to know that it was the dreaded pandemic that had stolen his beloved mother and father. When my father died in 88, I never got to know what killed him uh, because I was, I was young. But again, nobody was willing to tell us, you know. They said, you know, he had a headache, he closed the chapter. And we also closed that chapter. But then, I later got to know in the, the early 90s, one of my, my aunties uh, told me that, look here, you, you know, I think she noticed that I was a little bit naughty and said, hey, guy, if you continue like this, you're going to follow your father's footsteps, you're going to get uh, HIV. And that's when I realized that, ah, he had died. He had succumbed to the, the, uh, the scourge. Little remains of Pablo's parents' legacy, but his mother's final words will always remain with him. She calls me to her deathbed and says, uh, look here, my son, I think uh, the party is over, I'm done with you. But I just need you to respect your uncle. Respect your uncle. Uh, he's, he's now your new father. He's going to take care of you. Um, respect everyone regardless of uh, their status and what they're doing. And for me, that's what I, I, that's when, that's when I, I smelt a rat. That's when I smelt a rat. The death of his dear ones from HIV left such a huge scar in his life. For me, my parents' death, well, well, first of all, when I lost my sibling, the one who followed me, here's a, here's a girl who died a virgin. She, she was born with, with the virus and she lived for only up to 14 years and she died. So she, she died, she, she paid a price for something she had no idea about, she wasn't, she had a whole life ahead of her, but it was cut short and it wasn't, there's no one to blame, I, I can't blame my parents because at the time they also uh, didn't know what they were doing, I mean, it was un, un, unexpected. And then my elder sibling, also one of them close, my two siblings also died and for me it was, how come, is this a generational curse, is it a family curse, what's happening? And for me, what happened to me is, I realized that, you know what? We have to stand out. Because this thing seems to be engulfing us. It's, it's like an amoyo bar. And for me, I, 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 I made a decision that, you know what? Let's follow the script. Let's follow the script of what does it take to survive uh, this scourge. <laughs> That was New Vision TV News. Thank you for watching. My name is Lynn Komjisha. I leave you with a fact file.